This is Software and Security Engineering, Lecture 3 and the fourth segment. Passwords are where the rubber hits the road for security psychology. Um, they're ubiquitous because they're by far the cheapest way to authenticate people to systems. You don't have to give people special tokens and um, you know the cost of onboarding an extra million customers if your startup is successful is close to zero. However, there are three issues. The first is, will users enter passwords correctly or will they make mistakes? And if you ask people to enter complicated passwords, then as people move from using laptops to using phones, errors become more of an issue. They're also a, an issue in less developed countries where not everybody is literate. The second issue is, will they remember the passwords or will they choose weak ones or will they write them down? Sometimes writing down passwords is okay, but often it isn't. And the third is whether they can be tricked into revealing them. Will you be making your customers vulnerable to phishing attacks, for example? Now, the standard advice that people give their customers is usually something like, choose something you can't remember and don't write it down, which is about as unusable as it can get, and is very often associated with victim blaming, with merchants who want to um, blame customers for fraud, blame customers for not using poorly designed systems better. So passwords are, are worth some study and we know quite a lot about the choice of passwords and pins. First, can you train users? Over 20 years ago a research student of ours, Jeff Yan, who's now a professor in Sweden, uh, did an interesting experiment. Um, he got 400 volunteers from among first-year natural scientists who were doing a service course in, um, in, in programming and divided these up into four groups of 100 students. There was a control group of 100 who were given the standard password advice of choose something you can't remember and don't write it down. There was another silent control group of 100 who weren't told that they were a control group but who were observed. There was then a green group who were told to use a memorable phrase, think up a sentence and use uh, the first uh, or, or perhaps the second uh, letter from each word um, as their password. And then there was a yellow group um, who were given a piece of paper with random characters on it and were told to just get a pen and stab the, the paper eight times choosing eight characters at random, then write them down, use this as a password until they remembered it and then uh, destroy the node. And the 400 students were measured for the strength of password, which was measured by looking at the encrypted passwords in the password file and then trying to brute force these to see which were easy to guess. And they were also monitored for memorability, memorability of passwords by um, counting how often they went to um, sysadmin and got the password reset. And we expected to see that the yellow group, the random password group, would choose stronger passwords than the green group, which used a memorable phrase, which would choose stronger passwords than the control group, which got the standard advice. And what we actually found was that the yellow group and the green group chose equally strong passwords, and they were both better than the control group. What we expected to find in memorability was that the yellow group would remember um, the password less well than the green group, they get more resets, and the green group in turn would get more resets than the control group, but we found to our surprise that the yellow group, the green group, and the control group all had their passwords, passwords reset about equally often. So from this we concluded that the best um, advice to give to someone was to use a memorable phrase. But what we also found was that we had 10% of the students in each group basically didn't comply with advice at all. They chose really, really weak passwords. And this is surprising because if you've got 18-year-olds um, who've just come up to Cambridge to study science and are really keen and um, enthusiastic and haven't discovered sex and drugs and rock and roll yet, um, you would think that that would be about the most compliant audience that you could find. You'd expect that almost any other group of people would be less willing to uh, abide by instructions, particularly in an experiment. So if it really matters, you probably have to measure password entropy. If, for example, the passwords are not being used by the users to protect their secrets, but to protect your secrets, uh, you have to do something to make sure that they actually choose better passwords than just password one, two, three. And 
This kind of wisdom um, is summed up in this rather nice XKCD cartoon. Um, companies nowadays often try and bully people to choose passwords that have got uppercase, lowercase, numerics, and special characters. And so you end up with somebody choosing a base word like troubadour and then munging it around, adding some um, numbers and some special characters so it will pass the uh, password checker. And if you think about that, that's um, actually fairly easy for a computer to guess uh, because you can start off with a, a, a dictionary of possible words uh, and then you can put in possible tweaks and with some reasonable probability you'll find such passwords. If, on the other hand, you're simply to choose four random common words, uh, correct, battery, horse, staple, um, then you end up getting more entropy, right? If there's two to the 11 words in the dictionary or thereabouts, then that's two to the 44. And you can make a nice little mental image um, of a horse and a battery and a staple and somebody saying correct so that you can uh, memorize it. You can, of course, make mistakes. I misremembered that as correct battery horse staple rather than correct horse battery staple, but at least it's an improvement. And the cartoon's point is a good one, that through 20 years of effort, we've successfully trained everyone to use passwords that are hard for humans to remember, but easy for computers to guess. So what can we do about it? Well, the first thing that you do, if you can, is to limit guessing. An example here is bank cards. Um, your bank card PIN um, is stored both in a cryptographic processor in your bank, which is hardware tamper resistant, and also in the smart card chip itself, which is also hardware tamper resistant. And so there's three guesses in the card, which you get if you use a PIN entry device in a supermarket, and there's three online, which you get if you use an ATM. Um, so you would think that a four-digit um, PIN gives you 10,000 possible PIN values. So if you had, for example, five cards in your wallet with the same PIN and um, uh, the bad guy who steals your wallet has six guesses at each, then the uh, chances that he would be able to get hold of your money would be 10,000 divided by 60, which is 1,000 over 6, which is um, 1 in 188, right? Um, so you would expect that he'd have to find dozens and dozens and dozens of wallets uh, before he got lucky. But in practice, the bad guy needs only about a dozen wallets, or perhaps even less, because people are prone to choose um, a small subset of the possible pins. So if you see somebody walking down the street with a 10-year-old kid, um, there's a fair chance that their bank pin is 2010, or failing that 2009, or failing that 2011, because about 10% of people will choose a child's birth date as a pin, and so on. And if you study what the distribution of pins is in real life, then you come to the conclusion that um, limiting pin guessing does do an awful lot of work, but it still doesn't make the world perfect. What else goes wrong? Well, very often what happens is that the bad guys hack a system and get hold of the password file, and if it turns out that you'd used um, Dingbat123 as your password in a gaming server, then if you also use Dingbat123 as your Gmail password, um, then you're kind of toast. So um, what do you do? Well, the first thing that you do is that you don't store the password file in the clear. And since the 1960s, good practice has been to store the password file encrypted. To begin with, back in the 60s, people would just take a fixed value such as zero and encrypt that with the password in order to turn an encryption algorithm into a one-way function, something I'll discuss uh, a little bit later on. Um, but then what the bad guys did was to create rainbow tables. What they would do would be to get a big dictionary and encrypt the constant value with every word in the dictionary, and then they'd have a, a list of encrypted passwords. And then when they stole a password file, they could look up the password just as quickly as they could consult the rainbow table. So what people do nowadays is they choose a salt. Um, for each password P, you choose a random number NP. Uh, and in the password file, you first write down NP, and then you write down NP encrypted by P. And if the random numbers are all independent and um, 
uh, and long enough, then this means that they're unpredictable. And um, the uh, assuming your random number generator is good, and um, this means that the bad guy is going to have to try all the possible values of the password for each encrypted value that he finds in the um, uh, password file. You then slow attacks further by using the encryption algorithm multiple times. Um, Unix used to use the DES algorithm 25 times, and nowadays some systems will use a hash function like SHA thousands of times just to slow, slow down the attacker. On top of this, you add breach reporting laws, so if anybody gets hacked and personal information gets stolen, then in the European Union and in um, almost all US states, it's now a requirement that you report this to the authorities and or to the users. And, and this means that big password breaches become known and other firms and individuals can then um, take care or change passwords or whatever. Another approach is to solve everything in the cloud. And when you log on to sites nowadays, you'll very often see an option to log on using your Google account or your Facebook account or your Microsoft account. And you then, if you press this button, get taken to, your, um, to Google or to Facebook, who then authenticate you and refer you back to the calling website saying, yes, this is rossjanderson at gmail.com. And the beauty about this is that the big firms like Google and Facebook and Microsoft know an awful lot about you. And if you're not concerned about the privacy aspects, then this can be used to provide extra security. So, um, for example, uh, Google knows that I'm within 20 miles of Great St. Mary's. And so if somebody um, were now to go into an internet cafe in Indonesia and try and log on to my Gmail account using my Gmail password, Google would immediately smell a rat and um, would say, now, hang on a minute, Ross, um, kindly type in the um, magic number that we've just sent to your mobile phone. And so in this way, um, authentication as a service is becoming concentrated in the hands of a, a number of um, large firms. This brings me to another aspect, externalities. This is an economic term for what happens when one firm's action has side effects for others. And an example is environmental pollution. Um, if you, for example, burn a coal fire or operate a coal-fired power station, then you're not only um, getting ash on your neighbor's washing, uh, but you're also contributing CO2 to the atmosphere, which can have lots of effects for many people for many years to come. And password sharing is another example of this, because... We have to enter credentials everywhere. People don't generally have the ability to remember hundreds and hundreds of really good, strong, independent passwords, so passwords get reused. And what's more, all the websites want recovery questions too. They want to ask, you know, what was your first school? What was your first pet? What's your mother's maiden name? And so on. And there's only a limited number of such questions as far as most websites are concerned. And so even if you can't guess someone's um, password with reference to stuff that you've stolen from elsewhere, you may very well be able to guess their password recovery questions if you do a little bit of research about them. Another externality is that many firms train customers in unsafe behavior from clicking on external links to entering payment data in frames, and um, much of the training that they offer their customers uh, really amounts to victim blaming. It's about saying, well, Mr. Customer, you didn't jump through all the 15 hoops that we told you to when you opened your bank account with us 14 years ago, so now we're not going to refund um, the money from which uh, th th that was defrauded from you. But that's not all. There are not just externalities of a vague and general kind um, between different firms all wanting the same password information. There are specific problems whereby the nature of the information um, that is required by different websites um, is different in ways which allow incremental guessing. And um, there's an interesting paper by Mohammed Amir Ali and his colleagues at Newcastle. In fact, it was uh, Mohammed's PhD thesis. And he went and looked at the top websites and he found that 26 of them use primary account number plus expiry date to do payments. That's the 16-digit long number from the front of your credit card. 
A further 37 use primary account number plus postcode, but many of them use only the numeric digits. Um, so the lab CB30FD would just be 30. And a further 291 ask for the primary account number plus the expiry date plus um, CVV2, the card verification value, on the back of your signature strip. And what's more, if you fussy around in the waste paper bins outside some shops, you'll find that paper receipts often have the primary account number plus the expiry date. They shouldn't. They should only have a few digits of the primary account number, but some merchants are careless. So what you can do is go and get people's primary account numbers from discarded store receipts. You can then go and check that they're good by trying to use them in uh, websites like Amazon. You can then go to websites that use the postcode too, and you can try all the possible postcodes. And then you can go to websites that use the CVV2 as well, and you can try all the thousand odd CVVs um, until you manage to find a CVV that works. What's more, there's some websites which whitelist good customers. Uh, and so if you manage to find um, a discarded primary account number and expire date from a good customer, uh, you may find that um, they don't actually um, alarm if you get some of the security information wrong. How does this affect individuals? Well, I'm, I've put in on the supplementary materials page a link to uh, an eye-opener of a story by Matt Honan um, from a few years ago about how security flaws in Amazon in particular, and also Apple, um, led to his being hacked. Now, Matt Honan was a journalist who'd managed to um, annoy some um, trolls and um, so how they hacked him was as follows. They found out his home address, his card billing address, by doing a Whois lookup on his domain. And then they um, uh, phoned up Amazon and they said, um, Hello, um, I'm Matt Honan. I'd like to add a credit card to my account. And um, they said, Certainly, sir. And um, so they added the credit card to the account. Then they called Amazon again and they said, Hello, I'm Matt Honan. And they said, prove it. And they said, well, here's um, the last four digits of my credit card. And they said, OK. And they said, I'd like to add another email address. OK, so that's fine. So now he could go online to Amazon and he could uh, change the Amazon password. Um, what he um, then did was to go to Apple, whose password reset at the time needed a billing address plus the last four digits of a credit card. And since he had put a credit card on Amazon, he could see the last four digits of the other four credit cards that Matt Honan had used in Amazon. So he was able to pass the um, Apple security check, which enabled him to brick uh, Matt's phone and MacBook. And then what he did was to go to Gmail password reset, which sends a message to the backup email, which was um, Matt's um, Apple account. And they then, in addition to wiping his phone and MacBook, they wiped his Gmail and then since the Gmail had been the recovery for his Twitter, they got his Twitter account as well, and they sent racist tweets from his Twitter. So that's an example um, of how, where you've got a world where some people's security information, some people's password information, is other, is, is, is other firms' public information, that um, hackers who understand this can find a way through the jungle so that they can um, compromise um, completely unwitting people who haven't done anything wrong and caused very bad things to happen to them. So this is uh, my last example of an externality, that how one firm behaves affects the security that other firms in the ecosystem can offer to their users. And this is one of the things that you've got to be careful of if you end up designing security uh, for um, your employer or indeed for your own firm at some time in the future.